Kundelka, yeah. Nyarangek Rebecca. I am a Jaja Wurung Duri. Kukuruk Kilpo Moninginamen, Caroline Malcolm. This is my bloodline to my apical ancestors. I come from a long line of Jara women, um, strong Jara women that I'm very proud of. I'd like to acknowledge my ancestors in Dada Wurung, we call them um, Maringa Kulimurum, which is ancestral spirit of the land. And we hold this belief, this thinking, when you, thank you, when we've been in a place for so long, we only eat from this land, we only drink from our rivers. We, we are essentially this land. We are 80% water. When we drink from the Loddon River, I'm 80% the Loddon River. At the end of our lives, we go back into the land. And so here we say ancestral spirits of the land. They're here with us. They watch over us. They give us signs. And um, they, are, they walk amongst us. So please join me in um, speaking some of my mother tongue, Dada Wurung Dali. Let's firstly say Dada Wurung. Thank you, that's good. Dada Wurung. Um, it's tricky when we're, when we're taught English and the U-N-G, we always say like sang, lang. Well, the U has a U sound in our language, so it's Wurung. It's Bunjo, if you know of our creator spirit. And the next thing I'm going to ask you to say is Wukan Delkek Jai. Wukan Delkek Jai. Bamati Guli. Baduroi. I love that, that I could have just made you say anything. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but don't worry, it's not a Mumba situation. <laughs> I actually just invited you to say with me, I give my respect to the ancestors and to this country. So thank you. And thank you for those who participated in the smoking ceremony out the front. This is a tradition that we have been doing for a long time. And it's part of our awartaka, a welcome ceremony. Um, so traditionally, our people would... Um, we would invite our visitors who were waiting in the neutral ground to come and join us in a circle um, where Uartaka, your purpose was stated, your intent of coming to our country. Um, once the, the conduct of how you would um, conduct yourself in our country was defined by the laws of Bunjul that were bestowed to my ancestors, um, then there would be a wukjara, a gift exchange. We would offer a tanuk of water that you would sip through a straw, a reed straw. Um, we would sip it first to show you that the water was safe to drink on our country. And then we would offer it to you. Um, and then in this fashion, it is walking those laws by saying you're welcome to what you need while you are on Jara country. So may we have all we need today. Um, may we learn, may we, um, may we listen deep. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Meg and Patrick, for inviting me. Um, I'm just as keen as all of you to hear the discussion tonight, the yarns. Um, was it, it was a lady outside who asked me to explain the ceremony, so I skipped over that a little bit. I put it in a nutshell. When you walk through the smoke, you are, um, you're showing respect to our people because as part of that Wartaka ceremony, after all of that, you would wash yourself in the smoke to show that you are not bringing anything in from another space, anything of heavy energy, lower vibration um, that might be... Um, it might be something that you're carrying. 
It's just like, you know, the mob that come to your house and argue and fight and kind of kill the vibe? It's saying that you're not going to do that because you're leaving that fight uh, outside. So that's the more uh, meaning behind it. The other part is, is washing your spirit of it. Um, when, when we have those things we're holding in our body and in our spirit, it helps ground us and uh, helps us be more present. So that's that ceremony and thank you for being a part of it. I want to sing a, a quick song. I was going to sing to you our cleansing song, but I left my clapsticks in the car. Uh, we're all human. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> Del Kunja Muru, Pundu da Del Pai, and Goda Nuraki. Del Kunja Muru, Pundu da Del Pai, and Goda Nuraki. Where praying Mamui, where praying Mamui, where praying Mamui. Nurning working Del Kup Nanila. Pundu da del pa, yengo da nuraki. Waya parang mamui, waya parang mamui, waya parang mamui. Nerneng working del kup nyanila, pundu da del pa, yengo da nuraki. Thank you. Um, that song I was just singing um, is saying, in good country spirit, as we travel over country, May Bundu watch over us, and when we gather around the fire for um, Nurnang, Wurakang, and Delkup Nyanula, that is um, listening, talking, and deep listening and knowing when we can really relate to what's being saying. Um, and may we, um, may we have that today. I'm looking forward to it, so I'm not going to talk much longer. Um, I can share a bit about our country, but um, a bit more with you. I know it's, I w whenever I come to someone else's country, I want to know a bit about it. The funny thing is, I was reading uh, part of your book the other day about uh, the emu, uh, <laughs> some of your unresolved issues with the emu. <laughs> funny thing is, you are right now in the home of the emu, Lani Baramu. With Lani Baramul, home of Baramul the emu. So, um, Lalgombuk, Mount Franklin, is known as the emu's nest, this crater. Of, yeah, that's um, volcanic, the stories of the two volcanoes of Lalgombuk and Darangawa. Um, so, these are stories for another time, but it's a, a quick overview of this. Um, we are the people of Bunjil and Wa, the eagle and the raven, and these are our moiety systems. And we also, what makes Jara country special and different from the other four tribes of the Kulin Nation is that we have um, Mindi. And so Bunjil is the one who bestowed the laws to us, and Mindi is the serpent who our people feared. He was the punisher of lawbreakers, a giant serpent that traveled through the trees. And there were certain clans people, medicine people that could uh, call upon Mindy. And so they were of Bunjil Moiti. They could um, talk to Bunjil and Bunjil could talk to Mindy in that sense. Um, and so this kept the, the balance uh, of our people. So Mindy, Mindy rests on Jara country, but all um, Kulin people know of Mindy 
In fact, this head clansman, um, Manangabum, who was the one known to call up Mindy, when he was arrested and taken to Melbourne jail, all the blackfellas in Melbourne fled. They all just left Melbourne. Yeah, they were worried he was going to um, call on Mindy down there. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. Anyway, there's a few, a few um, stories I could, I could tell, but this is not my show. So um, on behalf of uh, my ancestors, the Dada Wurrung Martinga Gulimurip, um, Bengek Wartaka, Bengananu Jandak, Lani Dada Wurrung Gundicha, Lani Maringa Kulimurup, Noldorong Yana Delkup Murupuk. Um, welcome to the home of the Jaro people, the home of our ancestral spirits, um, and may we walk together in good spirit. Uh, thank you so much, Beck. Hello everyone, my name is Meg and on behalf of uh, tonight's organising committee, I would like to welcome you. So thank you for coming out on a windy Saturday night. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, all elders who are here in this room with us tonight, elders of First Nations and all nations. So thank you so much for joining us. We really uh, wanted to run tonight independently. We wanted to uh, offer people entry for free, but we also wanted to pay our speakers. So we set up a crowdfunding campaign and people gave very generously. So thank you to each and every one of you who gave. Uh, for you, a bow and a curtsy. Um, tonight is being presented by our Hepburn Relocalisation Network and the School of Applied Neo-Peasantry. Uh, Hepburn Relocalisation Network, uh, HRN, was established 15 years ago by Sue Dennett, who is here tonight. Hello, Sue. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Maureen Corbett. And HRN puts on speaking events such as this. We have local uh, food uh, nights and equinox and solstice dinners. We have film nights. Uh, they also facilitate free monthly workshops in fermentation and herbal medicine, natural beekeeping, and they also run the local seed library, which runs out of our uh, food co-op. Um, Artists' Families, School of Applied Neo-Peasantry, uh, runs out of Trielbo University in sa southern Jarrah People's Country here in Dalesford. And they run non-monetary courses in permaculture living and neo-peasant skills and knowledges. They facilitate monthly grief circles, a bush school for kids, and they facilitate our town's three local community gardens. <laughs> Tonight is the third in a series. Uh, four years ago, uh, Bruce Pascoe sat here with David Holmgren, he's here, hello Dave, um, in the town hall um, and had a great yarn. And then a few years later, it was David in conversation with Beck, hello Beck, <laughs> um, and an American scholar and food activist, Eric Holt Jimenez. Um, and both of those uh, nights were filmed and they're on the Artist's Family YouTube page. Uh, a reminder to please turn phones off uh, if you have to have them on for babysitting or booty calls then please put them on silent <laughs> um, so the rundown of tonight's event uh, in a minute I'll sit down and hand over to Patrick uh, he will do an intro these guys will have a chat uh, then we'll open it up to question and answer and I think we've got a roving mic is that right Lord? no roving mic just loud voices Okay, um, uh, and then uh, please join us for an equinox supper. And for those who are a bit nerdy, um, the autumn equinox is happening tonight at 9.27 p.m. Uh, and thank you everybody who brought dishes to share for the supper. Uh, thanks for coming, enjoy. Hey. Thank you so much, Meg, thank you, Beck. Um, for welcoming us in and smoking us into this room. 
I want to first just talk about the fire circle we're sitting around. Uh, a bunch of us went out last night and gathered these sticks on southern Jarrah country, the eucalypt sticks. Um, they're old sticks, they're old timers, um, they're dead sticks. And, um, and then a few of us went down to the community garden and gathered up some calendula, which is this, this summer's sun. And, um, and the sticks, I guess, represent last summer's suns. Um, so, uh, a ceremonial um, uh, fire circle to, and, and uh, the format of tonight is to once again sit in circle um, and to uh, kind of draw on um, uh, all our old timers in this room, um, all of our old timers from many, many different places. Um, one of the things that I've really got a lot from uh, reading Tyson's work is um, a kind of invitation that I uh, had already taken up to connect with our own first people from wherever we come from. And one of the things that I've taken a lot from Anitra's work over the years, um, Anitra's work featured all throughout my doctoral work and has, has really um, loomed large in, in my kind of my own personal ethical journey, um, certainly political journey. Um, both, it's such a thrill to have both our, um, thinkers in this room at the same time. By way of introduction, I'd interpret your dreaming stories um, uh, and give that a crack and then, and then open with a few questions, leading questions, and, and we'll take it from there. Yeah, so Anitra, um, Anitra's dreaming um, to me is uh, a convivial world, a convivial society where, um, where there is modest consumption, there is shared resources, there's shared buildings and shared food. A world where uh, degrowth is made possible through strategic, not um, uh, confused and panicked collapse. A world where uh, frugal abundance is uh, all around us, a world where uh, women have reproductive sovereignty, a world where everyone has access to land to grow food, a world where um, consu consumption or high forms of consumption are seen as vulgar and greed is composted and um, seen as, as, a, as a thing of the past and, and something that we might tell our grandkids about that happened once. Tyson's dreaming, if I could um, in make an, another interpretation, um, is an opening to complexity, is certainly to, um, to uh, <clears throat> stay with the, I guess to draw on Donna Haraway, stay with the tr trouble of complexity and to, um, to form societies that based uh -huh. around a cus custodial species approach uh, where all of us become bioregional stewards of place again. All of us have a function in that world. Um, there's uh, a challenge uh, in Tyson's dreaming to um, not just stay with complexity but to stay with diversity. And I think in Tyson's dreaming that diversity and inclusivity are, are not necessarily the same thing. Um, <clears throat> the dreaming says the land holds the law, the land holds the language and the, and the land holds the logic. This is a, a society where narcissism is, um, is given over to eldership. And um, there's much laughing and yarning. I thought I'd just outline a few areas that we might explore tonight. And there's gonna be a really goodly amount of uh, question time. But I thought some of the themes that came up while thinking through, or Meg and I were thinking through 
um, inviting these two to come and meet were obviously wide ranging um, with you guys. But, but maybe a place to start is this uh, notions of limits, um, um, which David is, is also very strong in this area. But there, there seems to be, whether you're a ne ne neoliberal left or neoliberal right, there seems to be a um, default sort of uh, uh, reaction to any co conversation about limits or degrowth or, um, or criticism of growthism. And, and it always seems to, particularly in the, in the kind of Fairfax papers or the Channel 9 papers now and the, um, even the Saturday paper, it always defaults back to something like, um, oh yeah, that's Malthus and Malthus is old hat. And it's never, well actually this is the way most people have lived for most of human history, being sensitively nuanced and understanding of the capacity of the land to give forth and the capacity of the gift from that land and the gifts that go back in great acts of return, um, in s or, or simple acts of return. Thanks for bringing us in um, well, especially, you know, because we're brolgers and, um, and uh, my spouse up there is struggling with my little brolger boy son there. Um, <laughs> Uh, we're struggling with the emu spirit. I, I think he's normally not like this, but he's, he, I think he's struggling a bit. And he's got really big brolga in his belly and the old fellas haven't done the stuff that they need to do yet because we couldn't get back home because of COVID. So anyway, apologies for that. <laughs> um, um, yeah, and Megan, uh, my beautiful woman there, she's a uh, good Itala, um, eagle hawk, uh, dreaming there. And, Yep, and this little girl here is about to fall off the balcony. That's Oni. Hey, Oni. Hey, Oni. <laughs> <laughs> so if you ask me, then I would say that she's um, my compa, and that, so she's got that pull away core, um, same way uh, like me. Um, but if you ask her, Mum, probably might say something different. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, so we're 3,000, I'm 3,000 k south of where I'm supposed to be and she's uh, about 2,000, two 2,500 two k south of where she's supposed to be. Um, and it's just, just love the way you brought us in here. It's, it's not that common for it to be that way and, and to feel it um, worked that way, which is, was just lovely. So thanks for that, eh? Um, and I want to move to Dalesford now <laughs> because you've got uh, open carry knives and shoes are optional. It's freaking tick, tick. It's smoked proper when you come in, tick. That's, there we go. Um, yes, yeah, ticking all my boxes. I like it. And yeah, so you're very happy to be here. Oh, and thank you for Serpent Story too. That's something I've missed. Um, yeah, since since I've been down here, and that's yeah, I, that's things making more sense now how it all works. Love to talk more after for all that. Um, this is um, my book wasn't doing very well before COVID because people thought it was a bit pessimistic about the future, <laughs> and then then the future got here and people started reading the book, and I haven't been out of the house since then. This is the first time I walked into a room and in my life, I think of people looking at me who know me and I don't know them. <laughs> so I'm, I'm struggling a bit with it. So just bear with me there. We've just been inside for like a year. Yeah, this is, this is my first time off the, off the leash. And I just fall straight into an emu nest. How, you know. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, and so what's going on for you? Me? <laughs> And yeah, okay. we're, we're just going to be funny, us two, we decided to be funny. <laughs> because, yeah, you know, it's my adult ADHD is killing me up here, so I've got we got to do that. So let's just riff. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I thank you all for coming this evening. And absolutely beautiful acknowledgement of country and I had the pleasure of hearing Beck acknowledge country at 
a recent women's demonstration in Bendigo. And she repeated tonight some words that are just so relevant to degrowth when she says, come to the country, but just take what you need. And really, if you boil it down to everything and anything, that's what degrowth is. And it has massive synergies with the ways that indigenous peoples all over the world have lived. It seems like as if capitalism is really something that's different from the way that people ordinarily live and quite naturally live. So I feel that this is the really best place that, you know, degrowth, degrowth is what we want to get back to and get through to. So that's what really attracted me to coming tonight. Yeah, degrowth is good. Yeah. Um, and I, I first uh, met this mob here um, online uh, recently. <laughs> and I was teasing them and I was calling them a cult and all this sort of stuff. And they were really nice about it. Like they didn't get upset. I was calling him Charles Manson. <laughs> ah. It was awesome. Then I started watching some of his videos about how he's replacing diprotodons with goats and, um, you know, getting that fuel load down with that. You know, if you're not allowed to burn off, he's, he's using goats out there. And that, that's pretty creative. That's a disruptive innovation. Um, I, I guess if, you, if anyone's ever been out to West New South Wales, you see those, those wild goats everywhere out there, you know. And I guess in one way they make a bit of a mess, but in another way, there's not much fire out there either. And um, those guys, goats taste pretty good, especially the little ones, before they get too tough. Yeah, it's, it's about the nicest. Like, kid goat, salt bush fed killed kid goat is like the best thing you'll ever eat. Ever eat. It's just mm, unbelievable. It's like the other, other, other white meat. And it is white meat when they're really little. And they're eating that stuff out there, it's mad. Mm. And just feel free to jump in. Any time if you feel you want to <laughs> mix them up. Yeah. Um, so, and same way everybody else, I, I, I don't like monologuing too much. So if you, know, if you want to feel like calling something out, um, feel free. Not like, you know, YouTube comments kind of calling out, but you know, <laughs> something important. Yeah. I've got a question for you. Um, so, uh, a real interest of mine uh, all through my life has been money, right? Um, and I, in academic circles, I'm often classified as an economist, but I'm actually an anti-economist and my interest is in non-monetary economies. And when I was reading your book, I really felt like you're being put into education, but it seems to me that you're a bit anti-education yeah I like talking to people who are the opposite of me so you know usually if, if you see me with an interest in something that usually means that I hate it you know um, so I'm doing a lot of AI and talking to a lot of people in Silicon Valley right now because um, that's the thing that I hate most and I'm talking to economists which is um, you know it's good I just find it really boring talking to people who like the same things I like and who think the same things I think. So, um, you know, so I might have to pretend to, like, not like degrowth just to make it interesting to know. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm into degrowth. Um, you know, or just, I don't know, what was there before there was degrowth, before there was growth? Um, you know, there was increase, and we have increased ceremonies, and that's gone on forever. You know, an increase is, uh, it's not about increasing the size of the system, but it's about increasing the connections within the system, the interconnections. Um, all the combinations, combinatorials, relationships in that system. We have ceremony for this, and it's the way, you know, we basically make the patterns and sing those patterns into being of how everything's going to keep increasing that connectedness on country. Uh, because you can grow infinitely into the micro, but you can't outgrow the boundaries of your system. 
you know, of, of your region. Um, and you have to be interconnected with other bioregions as well, with other groups, because every system has to dump entropy. You're a system that has to dump entropy every day, once in the morning and probably once at night, and a few times in between once you're over 50, you know. And, you know, one system's entropy is another system's lunch. And that's supposed to be closed loops, that's supposed to be going back into stuff. It's, it's nice, you've got composting toilets here and, you know, kind of grow your roses out of something and that's awesome. Um, yeah, you've got to have those closed loops. Um, yeah, keep that entropy going around. That's how systems work. And if you're doing that in ways and you're networked in, and I guess we can talk about the economic patterns and governance patterns that come out of that, you know, then you're living under the law of the land, you're living under the laws of physics, um, and it basically all just works pretty easy. It, you don't have to work too hard uh, to make that happen. <coughs> it's a very complicated world now. It doesn't need to be complicated because um, complexity just does all the heavy list lifting for you if you let it do its thing. Um, yeah, so that's how I feel about growth. What, what do you think? I, I wonder, Anitra, if you could talk more about um, or, and both of you uh, about um, economics because when, again, when journalists or politicians or people in the media talk about economics or the economy, they're, talk, they're talking about one thing, but really we've had a relationship to economy that's far more diverse and complex um, that goes way back into many different uh, forms and, and the gift um, has been the dominant uh, economic form. Um, and the gift, of course, uh, economy is based on gratitude. And what, what we know we have, what, what we know that, um, that, that we are in some sort of reverence and um, uh, worship and ceremony and ritual around because, um, uh, because it's, it's what feeds us, it's what sustains us and then makes culture possible. And so, but I just w I wonder whether, yeah, this sort of appropriation of economy um, as being this one thing, uh, the, you know, basically a, a monetary growth um, idealism. Uh, yeah, it's 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 a bigger it's a bigger story than that. Yeah, well, um, I suppose I got. Uh, interested in all of this when I was uh, a child. My, um, my father and my grandfather were both engineers and, and used to talk a lot about science and mathematics to me. But I remember my grandfather saying to me when I was really quite young, he, uh, he was explaining to me about money. And uh, this is back uh, pre-decimal currency. So he said, um, what were four sixpences you know, are worth one florin. But he said, this is only because people think it is. And it, it seemed very weird. And what I noticed a lot about the way that both my grandfather and my father talked about money and economics was it was completely distinct from mathematics. And so, I realised from quite an early age that there was this whole patterned layer over the top of what were the most important values as far as I could see, social values and ecological values. And whereas indigenous people and people who work directly for, with the land could see the real values, the ecological and the social values in what they did and had this kind of direct connection. Once I read Marx, it was a matter of us being separated from the land and establishing this whole exchange value where it's like we're all mobile. We're all separated from land. And so over the years, I've developed um, a, a sense that we actually can't have sustainability um, without dispensing with money. 
So, I mean, that's a fairly radical kind of position, but especially like, say, with COVID-19, yeah, things, have, things are changing. People are actually questioning how we live. And it's quite interesting, but there's a team that have been working in Germany on a world after money. And they're actually funded by the Volkswagen Foundation. <laughs> so, you know, we've made it. <laughs> Volkswagen. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and Hugo Boss clothes while I'm driving that one round. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, well, I guess I, I'm just thinking about while you were talking that economy... I mean, our, our traditional economy and how, how much it's still in place um, because it's about um, flows of relations and, uh, and tokens, you know, that, that kind of store value. Um, well, I, so I guess mm, earlier we were yarning out there and, and trying to make our connections, I, I guess, with a limited time frame, which is probably why we started 15 minutes late. Um, but, yeah, once we started sort of getting there, um, they gave me a feather, and so, you know, that feather's something, and so I've got to think about, well, whether or not I want to take it now, that they're holding it out, and I think, well, if I accept that, then that means, you know, like I'm kind of connected, obligated here now too, you know? There's like a, it's like a, an entanglement, you know, so that's something down the track, you know, um, if I come out to your place, you know, in, in the future and or you come, you know, stop around with me and we might do some more things together and share some more story and figure out who we're connected to. Um, and sort of, I don't know, once you do that, then you, you guess, I guess it's this, it's not the feather that's the, you know, non-fungible token or something like, you know, the, it's not even a fungible token. Um, it's not like currency. But I, I think where it is, we've been talking about it lately, me and Megs, um, and I'm starting to think that, that, that it's, the story is like currency, you know. Um, I was saying an example the other day, you know, I'm in uh, Ipswich with Camilleroy Dixon's there who married in at Ipswich and helping them out with cleaning out the borer there that sort of people are dumping rubbish in and, you know, I'm uh, helping look after their nephew. Uh, so then I go to Walgett, and it's my first time in Walgett and I don't know anyone and I haven't got anywhere to stay and, and so then I meet the Walfords and they ask and then I mention the Dixons and then I share that story what I've done with the Dixons and then their family haven't heard of those Dixons for a couple of generations so they're happy to get that story. So I've got that story there that I pass on and then that's, you know, uh, I've got a bed for the night, I've got a feed and I've got someone to look out for me there. You know, and then, so then I connect up with uh, a lot of other mobs and end up with uh, George Rose um, looking after me there and sharing big story and taking me out to a lot of story places. Um, and he ends up introducing me to the Barkers uh, and they give me a platypus story. You know, so years later when I end up right up in Karanda, you know, which is the end of that platypus song line there, then I share that story from all the way down Narran Lake from... Um, from the old fellas there, and I, go, I call that name Barkers, and then the Grogan family there, they take me and look after me. Um, they actually give me a job. They give me some work um, mediating disputes, which is like, oh, nut. Um, <laughs> like, like land claim disputes, and I'm going to mediate that. I was like, ah. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, so you end up all over the place. Um, so, I don't know, a, a while ago, um, uh, like just before COVID, uh, they called me out to, um, they called me out from Armadale. Uh, this mob wanted me to come out there and speak and I was like, ah, oh, it's you know, not really worth it. Like it's a couple of days away from my babies and you know, it's like 150 bucks or something. And it's like, well, you know, I, I can't get away from my babies like that. And then, but then I'm like, hang on, what's your name again? And then I realized, oh, hang on, who's your mum? And then it's like, oh, okay, so your mum's um, old bandit's daughter, George Rose. And so then I'm like, oh, all right, I'm coming now, you know, because you have to, you know, because um, you have that obligation through those relations. And it's that story that's the token of that. So, 
you know, so he calls up his mum and she travels to it as well, you know, especially when we're all mm, sitting around telling stories about the old fella, he was really cheeky, you know, and having a good laugh and a good cry about that. And, um, and so they look out for me while I'm there, and that also means if any disputes come up, they're in my corner, you know, and protecting me. And as it happened, a dispute did come up, and, and they were really good, you know, stepped up for me that way. I mean, so you can see how it's a long story to tell about just, you know, a few things coming out of one, you know, a couple of weekends cleaning up a borer that was, you know, uh, being used as a rubbish dump. Um, but so you see how that works. It's like this blockchain, is, um, it's like this, you know, this proof of work at every stage and, and it's that story, you know, and it's, it goes on a grapevine, so that's always being verified, you know, because people will call people up, eh? I'm like, hey, this fellow here making out saying he knows Walford's, <laughs> you know him, who's he? Oh, yeah, Tyson, he's all right, he's a bit mad. <laughs> it's a bit mad, but he'll get it done, you know, she's right. Um, and, and it just goes like that. So it's like this uh, reputational thing you carry around. You know, so that's how that economic system happens. And there's trade that happens along those relations. But it's not barter. Barter is a myth. Barter is something that modern economists uh, invented to mansplain or, or no, nah, fiat-splain. Fiat-splain pre-debt pre uh, based, <laughs> pre-fiat, you know. Um, but yeah, so it was basically a system of, like I like to call it relational credits, that was the economy forever. Um, here it was those relational credits. And that's like, uh, that's in the bank, that's a, that's a mutual fund that, that just goes Yeah. I, I talk about the money economy being a debt economy and a gift economy being an indebted, a indebtedness economy. Yeah. Very different um, loading and meaning. And, Therefore, reticence at times to want to actually be in relationship. And so when people go to the shops and say, here's five bucks for a bag of carrots, there's no relationship required. But the complex relationship that you just described um, is, requires a kind of letting go in a way and, a, and not that sort of uh, individualist um, uh, kind of uh, siloed off um, from one another that, that the monetary economy is, has provided, which is supposed to be our freedom. Mm. But David, David Grab is really strong on this. And he, in his book, Debt, The First 5,000 Years, he, he um, um, talks about the, the problem of, um, well, really, basically, that transition from, from gift to money. And barter is this klutzy thing on the way, but it's also the way back. From, from money back to the gift. Yeah, that's, that's what I just said. That's Megan stole that from him, and then I stole that from Megan. <laughs> <laughs> if I can just do the chain of cit citation. Yeah. Yeah, nice. Um, yeah, so that if we're actually wanting to rebuild the gift economies and the indebted economies, um, place economies, relationship economies, then sometimes a little bit of formal barter, like we worked it out the other day, we're probably 24% reliant on the monetary economy, 1% barter, and 75% um, non-monetary gift, gift exchange with about 80 other households locally. So, but initially when we were starting this journey, maybe a decade or so ago, it was a lot more formal barter because the, the, the only place for barter, I reckon, is in the, um, is, is, is a kind of trust building moment. You haven't quite, it's not about money, but you haven't quite trusted that relationship. So you might just say, oh, well, let's, let's just make it a bit formal. Let's like. Well, it's a, it's a token, and that they use it in neuro linguistic programming. Um, Hare Krishnas do it best with, you know, when they try and give you that flower, they give you that little flower and then you're stuck. And then they've got to give you their pitch and you're like, oh, I have to listen to this now, he gave me a flower. <laughs> and you're stuck there for 40 minutes. That's what they've done to me with a feather over there. Like. <laughs> <laughs> you're up. Yeah, no, it's just sort of thinking about people giving you Bibles. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's even longer. Yeah. I think one of the big things, though, too, is is that 
because our system runs so much in terms of money, we think of exchange as being the way that the economy runs. Um, and it really has a hidden life in, in power relationships behind all of that. And the, the real thing that replaces money is people having direct control over their production. So in indigenous communities, people set out in various roles so that they're producing the needs for the local people. And in a sense, this is what we need to be returning to because there's so many efficiencies and economies by doing things locally. You can actually see what you're doing to the land and you can regenerate the land and you cannot use various trees or plants or animals if they can't take that or you use more of them because there's a surplus or whatever. And uh, so a lot of what money has done is actually we're giving up our power, our power to this kind of like magical or exploitative or whatever, however you envisage whatever it is. And uh, so these are some of the things that sort of make all the connections between the fact that we have a growth economy. In a monetary economy, there are actually no operating systems for working backwards. You can't degrow. And I mean, this is one of the big failings of capitalism, of a monetary economy. It, it, it only kind of works if you keep on making sure you've done too much. And that's what a marketplace does. Whereas if we're talking about degrowth, um, economies, relocalization and indigenous economies, there's a very firm idea to begin with what people's needs are and you're just producing for those needs. And then over and above that, yeah, you might gift things and all of that kind of thing, but there's a very basic understanding that if someone needs a home, if they need a bed, if they need food, you give it to them. And we live in this weird society where we're actually sort of reprimanded and disciplined and educated not to do that. Yeah. And there's, um, I mean, there's, I mean, I mean, I guess the inequality sort of comes in here. And um, I mean, we keep getting told that, uh, you know, climate change and species extinction is, you know, that that's our fault because humans naturally just wreck everything. You know, we keep getting told that inequality and racism and sexism and all the isms are our fault because humans just do that. That's natural to try and like, you know, um, get one up on everybody else because it's you know, dog eats dog, and that's how we're patterned as a species. I mean, we all know that's not true. Anyone who's had a fire go through, you know, knows that afterwards when the smoke's cleared, like, you know, they know that that's not how we treat each other. You know, we come together in the, in the right way, you know, in those disasters. A disaster, a natural disaster is just... Look, a state of disaster is basically that's when the state that's currently controlling our lives is removed for a minute. You know, the economy and the, um, and the government are gone um, for a while, it's disrupted, and then we just get back to what we're supposed to be doing as human beings and we look after each other. I always look forward to disasters. Um, <laughs> that's when things come good. You at least see who we really are. And um, this economic system, a growth-based system, none of us like it, none of us wanted it, but it, it is the direct cause, the structural cause of inequality. People think that structural racism means that you've got a, you know, a lot of people in positions of authority who have bad attitudes and that that's what makes, that's not what structural means at all. You know, it's the structures are non-human things that sort of bend people in those ways and force people to be that and force people to enforce a caste system and 
Growth-based economies need a caste system because you can't price anything in a growth-based economy unless it's limitable and excludable. You have to be able to have artificial scarcity, you have to have people missing out, and you have to be able to identify who those people are. You know, with your real estate, you have to decide where you're going to put the tracks and what's going to be the wrong side of the tracks and what's going to be the right side of the tracks and how the hell you're going to force the lower caste people to be on that wrong side. You have to decide who they are and you have to get them there, otherwise nothing can have a price. You can't price it without that discrimination. Um, you have, I mean, the basic laws of supply and demand. Uh, you all know this in a growth-based economic system, chapter one, every economics textbook, demand must exceed supply. You've got to have, I mean, they talk about equilibrium and all this sort of stuff, but I've never seen that unicorn before. You know, this, um, the demand has to exceed the supply, i.e. there's got to be more people missing out on stuff than there is stuff. Um, and so you need a caste system for that. You know, you need to make sure that you're oppressing half the population. Um, that used to be easy with just gender, you know. But <laughs> <laughs> you could just go 50%, no worries, he's down there. Finished. Um, you know, it, it, yeah, it gets complicated when you throw like different ethnicities and, and things in there as well. It was easier just when they were just doing that over there, like in Holland, where they invented finance. Yeah, I could tell you stories about that too. <laughs> and they invented art speculation. The Dutch, so I, like, finance and art speculation, so I blame them for NFTs. Because yeah. that's like, mm. Tyson, do you use the word class instead of class for a reason? Is that not class that you mean? Yeah, well, I think, I think uh, sorry about that, but caste is more... Um, all-encompassing. I mean, that's everybody can find themselves there. Um, you know, it, it's kind of become unfashionable to do class because that's you know economic Marxism, and nobody wants that anymore. It's it's more about um, identifying where everybody's unique and beautiful intersectionalities are, and you know, and um, and we kind of judge everything on that and we judge it on an individual case-by-case -case basis, even though we're talking about group identities uh, with regards to you know, social dimensions of, of you know, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, I don't know. We're encouraged to fight culture wars around those things now rather than around class. Um, you know, and we're encouraged to just fight those endless battles because that's the only policy that we're allowed to actually affect, not anything structural or helpful. You know, basically we can just, you know, argue amongst ourselves over who can marry whom and, you know, <laughs> who can braid their hair and who can't and, like, frickin' who's allowed to wear hoop earrings. These are the important issues that we're all engaged with now because you're not allowed to mention class anymore. I say, all right, well, neither. Like, get rid of all of it. Uh, say what it is. It's a caste system. You know, we have untouchables here, you know, and, um, and a few above that. And, you know, yes, all different kinds of the, those group identities I mentioned before are thrown into that lower caste, um, half of society. Um, but there's, you know, individually we have social mobility if we want to fight for it and, um, you know, burn our lives and, and leave it behind as we progress. And that's individually, we can all do that. So it's, ah, oh, it's the land of opportunity, you know. We can all bloody, you know, own a coal mine if we work hard enough. <laughs> no. Nah. Yeah. Um, um, one of the things that a number of us are, are working on around here, um, Tyson, Anitra knows this pretty well being in central Victoria, is working, um, chipping away at the different capitalisms. And permies around here um, and neo-peasants are really like focused on um, decoupling from food, energy and medicine capitalisms. 
but understanding that the bigger picture is land capitalism and the monetization of land and the stresses that puts on the land and all, um, everything really, or non-humans, but particularly um, young people coming through um, and not having access to land. And um, there is still some countries that, you know, treat land the same as a loaf of bread, like as a, as a basic need. But in this country, we're probably champion it um, as, as, as one of the biggest capitalist forms. And it just seems to be that underpins the, the deep, one of the deepest structural problems is the capitalization of land, particularly stolen land. And um, I just wonder whether we can stay with that for a bit and, um, and even open it up to, to, the, um, to the audience for some, some comments and some questions. Rita, do you think that um, the earlier model of British mercantile capitalism before land was capital, do you think that was good and sustainable and a very different beast from what we've got now or no? No. Or just no. That's it. <laughs> 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 it was supposed to be a provocation. You were supposed to riff on that one. <laughs> Just nah. <laughs> um, the British um, mercantile system was actually based on what you were talking about before, the Dutch financial system. It was really the Dutch financial system that, that preempted the, the trading stuff on a world monetary system scale. So you kind of actually really can't separate them. Yeah, that's why I said no. But that was, see, but the Dutch doing that, that was our fault. Y y Janka Portis, specifically. <laughs> Good. Because <laughs> we speared them 500 years ago and they, <laughs> and they went back home then, and then went, what are we gonna do? Like, we can't keep having these losses. People keep spearing us. And then, uh, you know, first corporation, off it went. Yeah. Just a way to shift accountability around. <laughs> we did that. Yeah. That was our fault. Yeah. <laughs> More specifically, it was our women's fault because <laughs> the Dutch, like because women were chattel over there in, in their, their country, when they came, they thought because they gave us some rice and soap that they could take women in, in exchange for that as a commodity. And, and our women did, did not go along with that mm. a, at all. And, um, you know, there, there, were, there was blood. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So that was all our fault. <laughs> It's a great story. I've heard you tell that before. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's good. Um, yeah, so just to, yeah, do you want to just speak to access to land and, and, and the limits of diverse economies and indebted economies and gift economies because of the absence of um, access to land? Yeah, well, I think that in um, a collection that I co-edited with um, Francois Schneider, um, who's a degrowth um, activist from France who actually became famous because in 2004 he took a donkey, he didn't ride it, he took it for his belongings and he walked for over a year around France just talking about degrowth and finding out what people, talk, what, what people thought about growth and degrowth. And uh, as a sort of as a consequence of, of that kind of grassroots activity, degrowth is so well known in France today that in 2019 they had a couple of polls um, in which they asked people about the future, and in both of them, um, degrowth was the favoured future um, for uh, for French people, which is really interesting because. Um, if you read or, you know, mainstream media or even a lot of social media, you sort of think completely otherwise. Everyone just says, oh, but how could every, anyone sort of become decommodified, could not be involved in consumption and this, that and the other. Um, but... Um, what's really good about French people is, is that they love food and, uh, and they, they love farming and so there's a lot of localised economy that still remained 
um, on the basis of that. But in the um, Housing for Degrowth book, um, that, as I said, was a collection uh, of different case studies. One stands out, and it was written by an Australian um, who's lived in Christiania in Copenhagen for a long time. Now, this is a, a, a squatted area and barracks that was taken over um, by hippies, in a sense, um, in the early 1970s. Um, but then during uh, the early uh, 2010s, around 2011, 2012, they were forced into a position where they actually had to uh, make an agreement with the state. Uh, over the, they probably would have brought in the army. Um, and smashed them all, so they uh, they turned back to being partly um, under government regulations in Copenhagen. But meanwhile, what they'd actually done um, during the 1970s, 80s and 90s was they had a whole series um, of buildings that had remained um, in this vacated barracks and some of them set up accommodation by retrofitting those buildings. And other people uh, got recycled materials uh, and built their own dwellings. Everything was done modestly. And the way that you uh, went about doing that was that it was broken up into neighbourhoods. So you got about 1,000 people and about 14 neighbourhoods. Uh, of various sizes, but these neighbourhoods would run meetings like assemblies and had different working groups for various things. You'd go along and you'd say, um, I want to um, either, you know, use this old floor up here and turn it into some dwellings, or you might have, you'd probably have a collective of people who decide that they might do that, and some other people made very modest dwellings, like tiny houses. And no one had to pay rent or anything. Um, they, every, everyone who lived there had to pay a, a certain amount, which was just to cover things that the whole community needed to buy in or whatever. But there's no actual rent as such. They just divvied up the housing on the basis of people's needs. And sometimes people had split up or they'd have to start to have more children or whatever and so that they just then they'd move people around accordingly. And I, this is really sensible, it's really straightforward. What we face today in terms of real estate and everything else, it just seems to be so complex and so uneconomic and so stupid basically um, so there are people in Berlin, for instance, they've got something called Mietshauser Syndicat, um, which is a big umbrella organisation, but started off when people got together who didn't have much money, but they had enough money to get a deposit on um, a really inexpensive house, which they then all worked on and um, got it back, made it habitable. Um, and then they, they uh, were able to skill up other people who did the same thing and now they've got almost 200 houses and the syndicate itself, which is like an umbrella organisation, actually has, after they got a series of houses, this sort of became um, material that, that they could use or assets that they could use with banks and so that they could arrange loans more easily and everything. But they're really scared that people could, after they'd paid off their houses, just then maybe sell them for a profit. So the syndicate is this operation whereby you're a member of this but you can't sell out of that. You can only sell within it and you sell it back at kind of like prices that you originally paid for it. There are other kinds of models. There's a different model in the UK and this kind of thing. But I think it's these kinds of things that, that we need to be working towards, but all of them working back toward, to what um, many indigenous peoples do and what was done in Christiania is, is that you meet people's needs. We have a lot of... Um, <coughs> 
needs that are in housing that need um, meeting at the moment uh, with COVID, uh, a lot of affordable housing or rental properties were bought up and um, some, well quite a lot actually, just from virtual uh, videos. Um, and as soon as COVID lockdown number two ended, they all popped up as Airbnbs and one, one was next door to us and we had a raging party there last night, it was awesome. Um, and uh, so yeah, all throughout the town there's basically no affordable housing. And when I came here 25 years ago, um, there was one coffee shop in the main street and there was loads of affordable housing and that's why a whole lot of us moved here. Um, you know, it, there, it, it is like a, a, a real crisis and meeting that are a whole bunch of people, some, some of whom are in this room, um, who are addressing this at a very strategic level and have come tonight to potentially ask some questions and certainly listen to the conversation about how we're going to um, address this issue. We've got um, Councillor Jen Bray here tonight. Thanks so much, Jen, for coming. We've got a new council that a whole bunch of us worked towards to get who um, are open to um, active democracy, much more active democracy. Um, four of seven councillors got in on the ticket of participatory democracy. And so there's a lot going on at the moment, but there's this real thrust. Um, it's a tourist gem. The state government throws huge amounts of money at this area to um, uh, at basically the tourist dollar, and it's more and more up market. Used to be, you know, little Airbnbs that you could uh, um, you could very cheaply rent, and people come up here and take the waters, go for bushwalks, have a barbie. But um, it's now very very much high end, um, and basically it means that. Um, that there isn't a service. People in the, in the, in the towns can't uh, rent here and therefore the hospitality industry is crying out for, for actual, um, uh, for, for workers, for um, low paid work and you need affordable housing for low paid work. And so it's just another product of the d d dysfunctionality of um, the capital model, the pr particularly the sort of late predatorial capitalism that we're, we've moved into. So, um, so there is a, big, a couple of big things underway that we're, um, a number of us have been involved in trying to get access to land and set up a very similar sort of, um, uh, something Tyson said actually, I think in the solidarity sessions a while back, I think it was on one of those po podcasts, it could have been another one, um, they all kind of blur. Um, <laughs> um, and it, it was about, um, well, the way I interpret it, I run a, um, or participate in a men's circle, and when we get around the circle, some of us um, occasionally raise that when you've got something that's trauma that's come down through the line generationally, um, it's really good to send it back. It's really good to, to see it, smell it, feel it, and send it back. And I was thinking that's actually a really good metaphor for, for ca the capitalization of land, that it's just more and more traumatized by more and more monetization. How can we actually maybe certainly buy that land and take it out of circulation of being a, a chattel on the monetary um, economy or the capitalist um, property market. So that's where a number of us in this room are sitting with at the moment. So Yeah, well it's tricky, especially if you're experimenting with pati actual participatory direct democracy in your community here. They're not communities that tend to last long because someone will coup you. You know, that's, that's how it works in the world. You know, uh, <laughs> You, you'll get cooed. I, I guess you fly under the r radar as a local government for a while, um, but eventually, yeah, someone will come in and, and there'll be terrible things that'll happen and, and, and this place will be raised to the ground and sown with salt if you get go too far with that one. Um, this is all from, um, you know, participatory d direct democracy, the, the missing chapter. 
uh, from Sand Talk. That one was edited straight out because I was talking up Gaddafi. It was basically all about Gaddafi and what he was trying to do. And if you read his Green Book, you'll see. Uh, yeah, if you've ever, has anyone here read Gaddafi's Green Book? All right. Uh, well, the thing that you're moving towards locally here, uh, the Green Book tells you how to scale it, how to do that at scale across an entire nation. And that's why he had to be stabbed in the anus on YouTube and, uh, you know, have Hillary Clinton cackling like a mad person um, over his demise. It was um, it, the most horrendous thing ever. But you're not allowed to talk about that. Um, and you're certainly not allowed to write about it. That, that chapter had to be uh, removed from, <laughs> from Sand Talk. And thank God it did, because I wouldn't be here talking to you now. <laughs> I'd be like the author of a book that sold five copies. <laughs> and yeah, I really, really do. <laughs> I really think so. There are just some things, like people's faces go blank uh, as soon as I say Gaddafi. Like, they just go blank. Except for in Tasmania, <laughs> because you've got the Mansell family there, not the Manson family, the Mansell family there. They, they spent time over there with that fella. And, um, you know, so uh, the indigenous community in Tasmania, they all... They all know who he is for, because they got that story there. It's that economy again, you know. That it, it goes, it can be an international economy too. <laughs> uh, always has been, you know. Where do you think we got dugout canoes from? Um, actually, maybe they got them from us. I don't know, but uh, you know, certainly there's been uh, trade happening from, you know, um, at least a thousand years. But I don't know. The dingo got here miraculously somehow, um, as you know. Uh, like 7,000 years ago at least, you know. So, um, yeah, he didn't just swim across. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence for ocean uh, travel. The, the oldest image of an ocean-going vessel is in uh, rock painting in Western Australia there, the oldest one on the planet. Um, um, there's a mate of mine, Victor Briggs. His family's got a story of an ancestor who went to Hawaii um, and back <laughs> in an ocean-going canoe and actually passed on to them the um, uh, our uh, indigenous method for dispute re resolution that always stopped war at the point of actual invasion and theft of land. Um, so that's why, you know, Polly's in Hawaii got a little bit of a different idea about um, <laughs> whether or not you can go into somewhere and, you know, Steal New Zealand kind of thing, <laughs> all that kind of thing. Sorry, any, if anybody starts screaming, like they'd, they'd be yelling from the back by now. And Maoris, they, 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 like, you, have you ever like been in a room with Maoris when they feel something? And, and they'll just go, hey, and then you'll hear it from the back, you know, and then, and then they start walking up the front and, you know, oh no, that's friendly, all right, good. And, <laughs> you know, they're saying all this, you know, fuck a papa and stuff at you know, like what is you swear my family or what's going on here? Um, but even better if you if you got uh, like Native Americans, they'll just be there like uh, you know everybody's here sitting so quiet and polite. But if there's Native Americans into the room, it's like yay! Like just all of a sudden from over there, just randomly, it's really cool. Uh, if you ever get to experience that, it's deadly. Um, yeah. Um, questions. Yeah, Annabelle. I think the question or the statement is, um, just for the purpose of the video, um, is uh, I think most people in this room would like to read that um, Un <laughs> published <laughs> chapter, and maybe um, maybe the School of Applied Neo Peasantry could publish it. <laughs> Sweet. All right, let's look at that. I'm uh, I'm gonna have to redo it though. Cool. It was on my old computer, but um, <laughs> yeah, it's all there. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, well, a summary. It was basically just uh, summarizing the entire Green Book thing and uh, doing it alongside um, this idea of indigenous governance. Um, I, like I basically tried to show like the fractal uh, pattern that spins out from indigenous governance that starts with uh, just this, everything's dyads, right? 
It's not uh, binaries, you know. So there's this uh, sort of autonomy and connectedness that, that happens. You are, like your autonomy and your sovereignty as an individual, it cannot be interfered with by anyone else. You know, you are free in the world, but completely bound by iron obligations of uh, kinship and relatedness and, um, you know, the law of the land. So there's always this balance that's going on. You, um, so you are an autonomous person who's within the bounds of, uh, of a collective. And that, that collective is an autonomous collective which is within the bounds of a collective with other clans. And then that tribe is an autonomous tribe which is bound within obligations, um, yeah, within uh, other regional groups, like tribes, collections of tribes, you know, so like um, Gamilaroi, Uluroi, Ualiai, you know, uh, Wiradjuri, you know, I I the people in that region, you know. Um, and then all the people in that region, that is an autonomous. That is, so you see this fractal thing where you've got, uh, you've got these networked, uh, business going out, like from that one dyad, it keep, uh, which is, you know, about that balance between autonomy and relatedness, uh, but that keeps going out. And that is the thing that prevents um, imperialism from going on. You can have warfare because every now and then you just got to get that off your chest and that's all right. Uh, however, you're bound, you're obligated <coughs> to sort of, I mean, if you push too far in that war, you're obligated to clean up your mess as well. You know, so I've, I mean, and I've heard accounts and stories from Mob in Victoria here that uh, the law here was that anybody you speared in a war, you had to then nurse them back to health and feed them until they were back on their feet again, until they could hunt for themselves again. Um, I think that's pretty cool. That was in one of the Warungs, but I won't say which in case that's a contested fact, but it was a really cool uh, story that I heard about that, you know. Um, yeah, there's, uh, so anyway, so I, I was looking at that pattern and I was looking at the same thing that was Gaddafi's vision. And he basically, um, he was trying to put this thing in place for so long, but he had to dictate <laughs> first. And he kind of hated being a dictator, but he was like, you know, well, I, we can't do this until everybody has a house. Everybody's got to have a home. Um, in my country and so he said and he stood up in front of everyone and he said my parents will be the last people to have a home you know they're going to stay in the tent and until every other person in this country has a has a home um, my parents will not have one and his dad his own dad died homeless before he he realized that vision but he did realize that vision he also uh, had a vision of equality gender equality and so he had, um, you know, lots of women in the military and, uh, you know, it, it, it every, in every part of the society, as far as he could manage it, women had to be equal. Um, everybody had to have access to a full and free education. Uh, there was a universal basic income. When people got married, they were given 10,000 um, bucks straight up as a wedding gift, you know, from the government. Um, the idea was everything, all of the assets were nationalized. And he was trying to move uh, towards this system of direct democracy, w which would start right down, you know, with the individual and, and the, that uh, all the pairs, the kinship pairs, but going into, so the family, and it, and it was coming out right out, so you end up with uh, regional government, um, and that it would be distributed leadership so that it, it would keep shifting. So yes, there would be hierarchies, but they'd be temporary hierarchies at the local government uh, level, uh, just as there is in families, you know, when there's different things that need to be done. Sometimes mummy's boss, you know. Uh, sometimes your cousin comes around and he knows more about gardening than you do, so y you all do what he says in the working bee, you know. It's kind of like that. Um, so it, 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 it had this kind of thing where people would be, uh, like leadership representation would be circulated through. Um, and this would come be how the funds, the nationalized oil, etc., funds uh, would be filtered down to everybody. Um, uh, would be like this so that people were doing their own budgets. 
So local governments would be doing their own budgets, and then that would fractal that pattern out to the regional, um, you know, the larger regional groups, and they would also have their budgets, and then that goes right up to the national level. So it was about repeating that pattern going right up to the top was what I could see in there. So I could see that him as an indigenous man, I could see that he was, um, he was trying to bring an indigenous uh, economic and governance model while he burned the oil, you know, which he knew couldn't last forever. You know, he was trying to set up an economy and a political system that would be the envy of the world and that would uh, unify Africa um, under a different economic system that was getting out of centralized banking. Uh, so that's why he proposed uh, the dinar as the currency for Africa. And bloody, bloody, blah, I'm going on too long, but just, I mean, check it out, you know. Um, mm. he, was, he, he was a really amazing man, and he did his best, um, and he probably would have got there, but he basically had to spend half of his time just trying not to get blown up every time they tried to blow him up. And usually they usually got at least one of his kids every time uh, NATO tried to take him out. And eventually they got him with moderate rebels, you know, from Al-Qaeda was the moderate rebels because, oh, he was just a terrible rebel, was, was Gaddafi, wasn't he? Um, anyway, I, I'm, I was really mad about that and I was still mad about it years later and I'm still mad about it now um, because he's really painted as this villain around the room, uh, around the room, around the world, man. Okay, <laughs> yeah, and um, I don't know, I'm hoping I'm getting some nicer vibes or at least more open vibes from around the room about, about <laughs> the potential of him not being that evil um, after all. But he's worth checking out, e even you check out that uh, black senator from the state, Cynthia McKinney, she's been very outspoken and, and she's even written books about him and stuff like that. Not a very good books, by the way. I mean, spell check at least, <laughs> you know, before you publish. But, you know, um, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah, she's worth uh, having a look at on that, that topic if you ever get to hear her talking about it. Mm. Thanks for asking Tyson oh, to And it elaborate. ended with, uh, sorry, um, I mean, after Hillary killed him, because she did, um, Hillary Clinton, um, it, it just ended with that line uh, in that interview where she laughed about how he died and, and was asked to comment on it, and she said... Uh, uh, we came, we saw, he died. And, and then off she goes. And I was just like, eh, you deserved to lose. <laughs> and we let you do that, so we deserve Trump. <laughs> we, we, d we deserve, oh, every one of us here, we deserve everything that's happened to us in the last three few years, mm. you know, because we let that happen there. And now they have slave auctions. You know, because um, to be black in Libya, that was the other thing. He, he, he made sure it was a non-racist country because, you know, his people were fairer skinned, but he welcomed in all dark skinned Africans and promoted them all up. Um, but now they have, they have actual slave auctions. Now that the country's been liberated, mm. now that it's free, there are black slaves being sold on slave blocks right out openly on the street. Um, that's, that's, that's freedom. Mm. And, um, oh, I, you know, F words are just, just sitting right here. Mm. So I gotta pass it on. <laughs> yeah, no, I feel that. Um, Anita, do you wanna respond to that? Or um, well, mm. when you were talking about some of Gaddafi's uh, visions, it made me think um, of another really kind of struggling uh, revolutionary vision that's being practiced by the Kurds. Mm. Um, so Ocalan, um, who's um, a really key Kurdish kind of theorist, he's, you know, confederated democracies of autonomous um, areas and people and the equality between genders and all of that kind of thing, all replicated, yeah. Um, I've actually got a book on my bookshelf which has been signed by Gaddafi. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Questions? 
Yeah, I might just re repeat the, the question, um, just for the purpose of the camera and the audio. Um, yeah, so what does a degrowth plant look like? Um, yeah, let's unpack degrowth and what, obviously growth is important. But it, it, it's, it's a parent tree, or more specifically a system of parent trees. Um, that's what degrowth looks like. It's, it's the big uh, trees that look after all the other trees, uh, that break up the phosphorus down and actually bring it up and pass it on through uh, the interconnected root systems, through mycelial work networks, all these sorts of things, and that those trees, you know, uh, they then, one by one, they die and, you know, give them their bodies back into that uh, as the other ones have been coming up. And they're evenly spaced, so it's not thick, you know, with trees, it's they're quite, you know, there'd only be like maybe two in this room where we are of those parent trees, and that's enough, you know. And um, every now and then one of them falls, and that's how it goes. It's, um, you know, one system's entropy is another system's lunch kind of thing. And they're the trees, they're the beings that look after that place, and they're the ones that raise up all the other trees uh, to keep them coming around. Not in more numbers, not in less numbers, but yeah, that's what degrowth looks like. Because all growth has limits, and everyone wants to pretend it doesn't, and, but the people at the top, they know that growth has limits, and they look forward to when it hits that ceiling, uh, because that's when you get the big wealth redistribution. Every time there's a disaster, you know, uh, it's a ratchet that tightens a little bit more, and it doesn't go back the other way. So they suck a little bit more blood out of the stone that is us, and they keep it going. So they know that, that infinite growth is a lie. Um, but they set it up for that because they know that it's going to keep collapsing. Um, and every time it collapses, good. Uh, you look into that, uh, there's a huge uh, EFT, I think they call it, you know, those big wealth funds. Uh, look up the one that's called ARK, A-R-K. Um, that one is a giant, and it's, um, it's grown as big as it can grow now, and therefore it can't grow anymore because it's massive. It's a whole heap of high-risk assets, a lot of toxic mortgage bundles and all kinds of things, but then also um, investing in disruptive innovation and things that may or may not work. Um, you know, um, massive, massive fund. And it's so big that it can't grow anymore. So the people who have been investing in that, well, they're taking their money out. And you can't invest in that anymore because it's stupid to invest in it because your investment has to keep growing and delivering a return, money on money return every year. So people have stopped investing in it. So it can only go one way now. And it's, it's, it's massive, no one's ever heard of it, but when it goes, it's like a tree that got way too big in that forest and when it goes, it's like there are vines stretching out to all the other trees and it's gonna pull off the forest down with it. Uh, that's that one to look out for, that arc. You look into it, you'll be terrified when you find out what's going on and where it's going to go. Um, these things that are too big to fail, they're there deliberately. Like they, um, yeah, they're, they're the things that, that are there for the cycles of boom and bust to keep doing that ratchet thing. You know, a cycle is only a cycle if it, if it moves like that. But a ratchet, I guess... Technically, it's a cycle, but um, it's a cycle that's killing us all. Yeah. I mean, I might just add a couple of things because degrowth is a really kind of controversial word and it's partly deliberately provocative so that people really kind of think yeah. about, well, what is growth? What, what's degrowth? But some people think that degrowth means poverty or austerity when they first encounter it. Um, and the Feminist and Degrowth Alliance have this uh, really good banner where they sort of say, um, your austerity um, is not our degrowth. Um, and I try and explain it by saying that degrowth um, is to growth as quality is to quantity. So instead of seeing growth at one end of spectrum and degrowth at the other, degrowth is actually like the complete contradiction. It's the complete, complete and utter reverse they in four dimensions. They not say just your, yeah. your uh, deficit is our surplus. 
with the mo wrong. modern monetary theory dudes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, inflation, so inflation, inflation. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so degrowth, think about quality. Think about real, real values. Whereas growth is all about monetary values and about more and less, you know, which sort of feeds into what you're talking about in terms of inequalities as being absolutely intrinsic to monetary systems because it's all about more and less. People talk about equality in money, but actually what's happening is it's always more or less. Charlie. Uh, <coughs> I'm not quite sure how to frame the question, really. Um, I feel fairly naive in this forum, but it's something that I think about. Um, it, it's, it, it's, I'm trying to frame what I think in the sense of what we're talking about is you talk about, we talk about growth and degrowth, where I tend to look at more of the evolutionary process that we're all part of. And that evolutionary process includes all biomatter as well as non-biomatters, non including everything on this planet that we live on, has a symbiotic relationship. And that could be framed within the, the context of of a life cycle, a cycle of life. We understand the life of the cycle of life being birth, movement, n n I won't say growth, I'll just say movement, and death. And that death brings new, a new cycle in another form. Evolution, how that fits in is the way I see it, is that it's the learning that we have from one cycle to another. So it's not a static process, it's, it's, it's a building process. You could call it growth, but that's where my other thinking comes in, which is we talk about stories, but we're always talking about and listening to our stories. One part of that evolutionary world, it's people are one, just one cycle. So we only ever listen to our own stories because that's what we do, and which fits into the survival nature of life. Life wants to survive, so therefore we only constantly listen to our story. I guess I wanted to just wanted to know what the panel thinks about um, how do we move through that so that we understand what is really happening and not just listen to our own stories all the time. Uh, life uh, 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 finds a way. That Jurassic Park, that was Jeff Goldblum. I don't do a very good Jeff. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> uh, if you check out, um, uh, read up or I don't know, Google up on um, evolutionary stacks and evolutionary fitness surfaces and all that kind of thing, and it's pretty much what was just said here too about, you know, it's about increasing quality rather than quantity. You know, so it's not really about degrowth because it still has the G word in it. You know, mm. it, it's you know, it's a provocation that term. But what it really is it doesn't have a word. And people are trying it with like regenerative, you know, etc. And, and and lots of terms like that. But it doesn't have to have a name. It, it just do it. It's it's mm. quality rather than quantity. It's like uh, I said, uh, growth into the micro rather than growth into the macro. Uh, I said increasing uh, complexity and relationships rather than increasing size of a system. It's all the same kind of thing. Mm. Um, yeah. So I can remember being very involved um, in the women's movement. And, you know, we didn't... We, we would have just closed shop very quickly if we'd done all of the marketing surveys or taken any notice of all the things that people were saying about us not being a success and, you know, women had been treated like this and, and it was natural for them to be like that and this was, you know, millennia long, it's been like that and this, that and the other. And we just said, no, we don't want that, but we didn't have a blueprint. We didn't have a really clear idea we just said no and waited for other things to happen. And I think that we're in a real crisis at the moment and this is the kind of situation we're in. 
it's good to raise questions because occasionally, and you've given a few leads on various things, we can have some ideas about things. But I think the most important thing is just to keep going towards where we think things should be, where we want them to be. Don't worry about whether you think you can do it or, or that someone is going to fight you or whatever, but just keep struggling. Yeah, and there's so many barriers to um, living your values and, um, you know, whether it be family putting pressure on you not to, you know, to put some shoes on when you go to the town hall or, um, or whatever you do, there's, there's huge amounts of um, barriers to stop us from really opening to our values and those things that we hold dear. Um, what I hold dear at the moment is something in my belly. S so, big thank you to Tyson and Anitra. Um, yeah. A really, um, a really big thank you to all the children as well. Um, you've been awesome. Um, and <laughs> And, um, but an even bigger thank you to the child minders and um, you've been even more awesome that you've enabled this to happen. A few people said, how do I, I want to um, contribute to tonight. People already have in the crowdfunding. But um, just a, I want to give a shout out to Nalderon Mob, of which a number of people here tonight um, who give to that and are part of Nalderon. Nalderon in Jara language, uh, Jajarong, um, means all together. There's a website which talks about Nalderon uh, uh, organization, education, all the great stuff they're doing. Um, and there's also a, a tab to pay the rent um, if, uh, if people feel inclined to um, give in that way. Uh, thanks so much, everyone. Uh, yes, thank you again to Tyson and Anitra and to you, Patrick. Uh, thank you very much to Hepburn Shire Council, who uh, very generously uh, allows uh, community, not-for-profit community groups to have access to the town hall and the senior citizens free, senior citizens hall for free. So thank you. Um, thank you to Beck Phillips, Beck and Mitch. Thank you. Not sure where they are. Uh, for that very warm welcome. Uh, thank you to Lorne and Dylan for doing the sound. Uh, also to Mandy Adermott for helping with the sound. Uh, thank you to Mel and Andy and Lee. Thank you so much for your help. Uh, thank you to Nikki Marshall uh, and Petrus for your help. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, thank you to uh, Alison from Twofold, wherever Alison is. Uh, they made the cookies and the hot cross buns. Um, thank you to Jen and Yindi and Minya. Thank you, guys. <laughs> You're the best. <laughs> uh, thank you to Blackwood Almond Jones for uh, putting up with <laughs> uh, mum and dad being slightly distracted the last few days especially. Um, and thank you again for everybody for um, coming along. Thank you to Sue and David for being who you are. <laughs> thank you for T4 <laughs> for the film and for the filming and for the lighting. Um, a last minute dash to go home to, uh, to light the event. Um, and thank you once again uh, to our very generous crowd funders uh, for making this night possible. Uh, please let's enjoy supper together. <laughs>
Nengora nuraki Waya parang mamuwi Waya parang mamuwi Waya parang mamuwi